All right. So thanks so much for challenging us, Mike. So, but I wanted to basically reflect a little bit because we were all at the launch of 8 Data 1.0 in Oxford. I don't know how many of you were were there. Maybe show, yeah? So I was just thinking how far have we actually come in 18 months? You know, in when we launched the uh, 8 Data 1.0, like everybody in the room was telling us like this whole notion of de putting development on a map geocoding, was much too complicated. There was no methodology, was much too costly. In, in a way, we were declared really crazy by our colleagues. Yeah? And so uh, when we all started this exercise, we really didn't know what we were. And the journey was very uncertain. And it's actually the second reflection I had here is, it's actually, I think, a very nice coincidence. You know, this is the way room where we had a major breakthrough for the open data because we invited Beth Novak and Hans Rosling. It's almost an honor to stand here, the same podium, where Hans Rosling made this huge, vibrant, very emotional pledge to the World Bank to open up its data. And now today, you know, we are reflecting about, you know, in a way what all we can do once these data are open and what or the next level we can take it. And, but if you first reflect on it, like uh, in, before April 2000, more, yeah, a year and a half ago, before May, you needed literally, there was no free access, it was exactly what MCC was describing. A lot of information was publicly available, but publicly available through print or PDF documents. And then second, I, I remember very well when I first met Mike, like we had this whole discussion because he argued with us that there were 48 different sites of the World Bank where you would find information on one single project. So, so can you imagine? So every, because unfortunately, many of our information reflect our organizational structures and not you know, citizen-centric information, user-friendly, so the way you would like to see the information. No, it's based on how we are organized. And that, I think, is a huge contribution of aid data, that it's pulling things together from different parts of, of available X uh, databases. But then, basically, uh, so first of all, it was publicly available, but literally you needed a credit card in order to get access to the data. It was only available through subscriptions. And then today's so were like um, teaching also, and my students, they never ever go to the library anymore. You know, if it's not on their fingertips available through a search engine, they are not using it. So I, I found all the references I give them on the syllabus, if it's not available, say, on Google or any other search engine, they don't read it. So that was a huge difference because before, of course, it was accessible, but you had to go to the library, you had to talk to the uh, library desk, you had to get the password, you had to get the software, only there were two machines where you could actually use it. So, it's, so the world development indicators were always accessible to you and everyone else, but it was very cumbersome actually to use it. So, so I think that I just wanted to start with. So now... Uh, I wanted, so now I thought to make the case why geography matters, but I think to this audience I, I hopefully don't have to make that, <laughs> what it seems like, but that's, that's how we started. So we did actually in, this is a real, real story, like um, Evo Morales, the new president of Bolivia, comes into power, quite left-wing government, and basically I was part of the first ever, the first bank's, uh, meeting with the new Ministry of Planning. And so you can't even imagine the silence in the room and the criticism and, uh, you know, the, we had to break the ice. And so the, the emphasis was like, aid does not work. Bolivia is extremely poor. You know, we've received aid for so many years. So the assumption is like, uh, what you would like to offer us, we were ex they were extremely skeptical. And then basically uh, what 
after like actually a four hour intense discussion debate in which the minister actually exited four times <laughs> to express his frustration with us. That at the end of the day, you know, we said, okay, let's just spend the next 10 days to work with your colleagues. So the question was, should he engage with us or not? Just to give you a picture how bad the relationship was. Yeah? And uh, then basically out of this engagement came, one, came two things. They asked us, first of all, where are the poorest municipios or counties in Bolivia? So where is the biggest need? Yeah? on Mike's uh, analysis. And then second question, where are the projects? So do we actually target the poorest of the poor? And so based on that, uh, this is the poverty map. Basically we did, and then we helped the Ministry of Planning to identify in the, the, the area in the circle, these are the Andes, and these are basically in these uh, counties, you have up to 90% of people living under a dollar a day. You have no access to health. 70% of people have no ac access to electricity. You have no running water. So these are the areas where you have the biggest need. And then on, in the east further, where it's 35%, uh, you know, the gaps within the country are huge. And then we did this. So this shows you where our World Bank projects were targeted. So maybe I should go back. So our role of our team is actually not to interpret those maps. But I cannot imagine you the level of debate and discussion we had with all of the bank management team working on Bolivia once we confronted them with these two maps. So I think the process itself is actually also an outcome. <laughs> so in a way then, there was a lot of discussion why is that the case, and then of course, now I'm a little bit unfair, I'm sorry I should show it to you per capita, because actually the eastern part is the new, where in Santa Cruz where you have the migration, so the population center is now moving to the east. So, so it's of course also a philosophical question, should we target where are, where's the, largest amount of poor people living? Or should we target the areas where you have the highest, uh, the highest percentage of poverty? So it's, it's not that easy to raise the population density, but basically what this uh, started was a dialogue and conversation, which before was never possible, at least not on the geography of aid flows. Now, uh, moving... Uh, so basically, before we started geotagging and geocoding and mapping, um, people could tell you exactly how many projects there are in health, how many there are in education was based on sector analysis. You could see um, <laughs> basically the different ratings, how successful the IEG ratings you just showed. But if you were asked just within a country, where do you target your aid? That was not discussed. It was maybe discussed, but it was not easy to, to visualize. And that's why I think it's very powerful. Um, now moving, moving ahead, the first question I had actually to you. Who of you know has ever heard about mapping for results? Oh, wow, I'm amazed. <laughs> Who has actually used it? Few. OK. So. Uh, so the so this is the mapping for results, but it's a process. Yeah, it's not a website. I always say this: this is not a website. <laughs> you know, we are not building websites. We are basically convincing our colleagues to be more transparent and to open the data sets and then to allow us to do analysis. So the second big question, after this, was one of the hardest questions I was asked for many years was how, like after the Millennium uh, Summit in New York, the question was how do our individual World Bank projects contribute to the overall MDGs in a country? So clearly if you have, say, infant mortality rates, 
So what is the contribution of a health project to infant mortality rate, to overall development outcome in a country? Can you establish some correlation or, or see how that works? And then basically, the principal idea of mapping results is exactly that, that you analyze, uh, maybe I, I jump to this. So here, so basically this is the question, are the health projects in the areas with the highest infant mortality rate? So the concept is actually quite simple. So we use subnational MDG data, like subnational infant mortality rate data, and then overlay that with where the projects are located. So that gives you some idea you know, about correlations. But then here, basically, um, the, uh, the question, of course, comes up here, and we've shown, Mike also showed this previously, here in Western Kenya and Yansa and Mombasa, there were relatively few projects, whereby we have a concentration in Nairobi and the, the Rift Valley in the center. And that, of course, then causes questions, no? And uh, now we have to be very careful interpreting those maps as well. This has nothing to do with causation. These are just simple correlations. So now, you know, the, the issue is actually what are the underlying things. But before that, just alone, if you look at the infant mortality rate, like previously we had literally for Brazil or China, we had one data point. Infant mortality rate data for Brazil or Kenya, you know, the map was, was one color. <laughs> it was one point. And then basically doing that analysis, the first thing we could, which we know, of course, but which we could show, and it's so powerful when you show it to colleagues, is that the, in it, the differences in living conditions within countries is much bigger than between countries. Say, for instance, here going back to Bolivia, yeah, in this area I show you in the highlands, the living conditions are the same level of Eritrea. You have one of the worst living conditions or uh, well-being indexes you can imagine. But at the same time, in a proximity of just half an hour, living conditions are as good or the poverty rate is as low as in Argentina. And that, you know, that is kind of something which is very shocking for many people, but since you make it accessible through a very easy to use tool for the public at large, it's completely open, you know, that kind of then steers a lot of debate. So now, uh, where do we, so first, what have we actually done? So the first thing is we started out with four small pilots. This was really a complete innovation. Like we, we partnered exactly with uh, Development Gateway and Aid Data because we wanted to try something which was different. And we didn't know where this was going. So we did four countries, which was uh, Kenya, Haiti, Philippines, and um, which one was? Yeah, Bolivia. Bolivia, actually, the first one. And then, within a, actually, a year and a half, we institutionalized it. So we basically scaled it up. So now, we were able to do first, then we were asked to do all of IDA. So IDA are the resources for the poorest countries. And that was a major breakthrough, because the IDA deputies, these are basically our donors, all of the donor countries came to the bank and said we have to better measure results and better observe results and better report on results. So then basically within the IDA replenishment, which is the negotiation, how much funding this IDA basket receives from the donors, the donors insisted that mapping results becomes mandatory for the bank, for all IDA resources. And so then basically uh, we first launched it for 79. These are the IDA countries. This mostly of them in, in Africa, 42, I think, are in Africa. And then basically just now, so this was in spring 2011, and now we just finished it uh, geocoding and mapping all World Bank projects in 100, actually it's 140, 
two countries and West Bank and Gaza. So basically that was uh, because GIS and mapping, and that's maybe a different, many people ask is what is different this time from many, you know, GIS has been used in the World Bank for 30 years. Like the animation David Wheeler showed, this fascinating thing about deforestation, these type of technologies the bank used in the 80s already for one specific project in Indonesia on deforestation, but not as an institution. See, that's the big difference, because one project manager happened to like maps and was convinced of the power of these tools, so then in some sector, one project manager used it, but not across the institution, and that's what is now different. So now you can use this differently, so this we've already show, shown. Of course, this raises now very tough questions, and uh, like in India, the lagging states, Anybody familiar with India in the northeast is actually an extremely poor area. And so uh, a lot of debate we have right now with uh, our colleagues in, in operations is why is it that we have so little investments in lagging states if these are the poorest states in India. Then, of, then another analysis we've just done, this was specifically requested of the director, the manager for infrastructure, and uh, human development. So the question is the sectors. If there's one thing we think I've le we've learned over the years, development is multi-sectorial. So you talk about infant mortality rates, like here in this case, the darker, the red, very red, are the areas with the highest infant mortality rate. So now, if infant mortality rate is not a health issue, it's not. It's an issue of overall development. So here, for instance, if you don't have access to clean water, you know, that's a key reason for infant mortality rate. So here what this map shows is uh, the blue symbols or icons reflect the water sector and the red ones the health. So what, how is it that the two sectors actually coordinate or work together? And, well, I don't need to spend time, but I think you can see where, where they're located. So they're not located in the same regions. So now uh, we want to take this actually to the project level. So this is the uh, feedback. So this is uh, the issue, of course, of monitoring. So here's the biggest challenge is how to ensure that citizens receive the service they're supposed to get. So this example shows uh, um, a poor woman, her name is Maria in Potosi, and she has received a solar panel. So this project particularly has as a goal to provide 1,000 systems in a very decentralized way to very poor families in, in extremely remote areas. So there are only, imagine there are only three people living per square mile. So it's, the, the population density is completely low. And it takes you, like, there are no roads. I mean, it's extremely hard to even get to these, to these areas. And then second challenge is that, each, in this case, the private sector is in charge of providing those services to the poor. So we basically provide the funding to the government. The government puts up a subsidy scheme that for the poorest of the poor, that's, that uh, panel only costs 50% of the market value. And then the private sector works with the, with the households to provide the services. So what we've done there is that basically in the project, in the government, we put in the system where now the government, every time they're sending out uh, basically an MNE a supervision mission, they're taking these images and show where, whether or not the households have received these, these uh, solar panels. And why was it important? Because before we did that, we had no heart-based evidence. You know, we had all these hour-long discussion with the, with the companies. How many systems did you actually install? Well, they claimed they had installed 12,000. And we found out through using this, they had just installed 9,000. And so basic, but we had evidence. It was not based on, on anecdote. This was really based on hard data. 
uh, now local data, Aline mentioned it, it was before, so this is just why you really care about your local schools. So this example from Jansa, this is a colleague from DEC, Johan Mistian, who has worked many years on this. So uh, basically here it shows that the, the, the way areas with red background uh, is the number of children out of schools. So it's the, the need for education. And the blue dots are the schools we are financing. And so basically you can analyze uh, gaps. So there's an area here in the center where there are, there are no schools. This is uh, institutionalizing it, so now every project manager in the bank has to geocode the projects, which is completely new. And so basically it's just a simple field in our institutional database that everyone is being asked where is your project located. Now, uh, I know I want to wrap up, but where do we go next? And so uh, if the World Bank is doing this, it's kind of interesting. But it's not really very meaningful because for the citizen, as we've just seen in Malawi, out of these $5.7 billion, we are one player. But we are just one among, among many others. That's why now, together with Sweden, we are launching the so-called Open Aid <coughs> Partnership, which is very simple to basically take this beyond the World Bank and to invite all donors to join in an initiative to also make their project data much more transparent available and to do a joint mapping. So it has these components. The first is to develop an open aid map, just basically the Malawi pilot to, uh, to do this in, in many countries. Second, very important for us, is country systems. So it's actually owned by the government of Nepal, by the government of Kenya. So it's not to be sustainable. This should not be donor driven. So here we would actually work with the governments to provide a lot of capacity development, transfer all the knowledge, the know-how, the technology, and so forth. And then the citizen feedback will be talked about. But then very important also for us is capacity development of CSOs. Uh, civil society organizations, media, and other intermediaries, because we feel that until today, uh, I actually wish we had this workshop in Kenya or in, in Nepal. Seriously, because I think people in those countries have to start using these tools, because it's not really only applicable for research. It's very important that citizens start using those tools. So... Uh, so I want just to uh, finish off with this example, and we work closely with the U.S. So uh, this was a, is a major breakthrough for us. Uh, USA shared uh, their data with us, and uh, we basically in Nepal work very closely together. And for the first time ever, I can show you this map of World Bank and USAID projects in in Nepal. And so we are launching this in, in Busan, and every, actually we also invite uh, CSOs and foundations to join. And uh, it's basically just making aid much more transparent and open. Thank you.